Now let's look at our chapter on gases. I suspect a lot of you will work with gases throughout your careers as nurses. Just as you can see here, the nurse working with the patient and administering some oxygen. And perhaps some of you are already familiar with this. So in terms of gases, we've looked at properties that describe solids versus liquids versus gases, but since this chapter focuses on gases, I want to reiterate it again um, in terms of the properties, and I've got an analogy for you here in a second. So <clears throat> pressure, the, dis the, force, the definition of pressure, the force exerted by gas against the walls of the container. So when we're dealing with gases, you're going to see that we're measuring and calculating pressures. The units of measurement for pressure. The most common is the ATM or called atmosphere, but we also look at and sometimes use millimeters mercury, TOR, which is just abbreviated TOR, T-O-R, or Pascal, or sometimes even kilopascal, which is KPA. Volume, we're going to be looking at calculating, measuring the volume, and that's the space occupied by a gas, or volume's definition is simply the space occupied by a substance. The units you should always be you should already be familiar with in terms of the units for volume liters milliliters cubic meter could be cubic centimeters several units of volume temperature we're going to be looking at temperature in terms of gases as well temperature determines the kinetic energy and the rate of motion of the gas particles the more energy the gas particles have the more they move the faster they move and how would could they get more energy well one way is by raising the temperature increasing temperature is applying giving thermal energy to the molecules or the reverse taking it away cooling something off removing energy slows down the motion of the particles temperature and this is really really important I even use my red color here. Temperature we know is in Celsius or Kelvin, but in gas law, in this chapter, we have to use Kelvin. Kelvin is required. So you may see that a temperature is measured in Celsius, is given in Celsius in the problem, but you absolutely have to convert to Kelvin before you do a calculation. The reason for this, the reason for this is a lot of times we work at the temperature of zero Celsius. Zero Celsius, well, if you plugged in zero Celsius and tried to do some multiplication, zero times anything is zero. So that's why we don't use Celsius. And then finally, N. N, which, N is the amount of gas. And in fact, it typically is in moles. Okay, G would be in grams, so N is moles, and we'll be using moles as our quantity of gas present. So all of these variables or factors play a role in what we know of as our gas law problems and how gases behave. So gases, here's my crazy analogy. Imagine you had a room full of three-year-olds that had no adults, had no rules, and had just been given lots of sugar, lots of candy. They would be bouncing all over the place, all over that room, hitting the container, bouncing off each other. Okay, it would be sheer chaos. Okay, sheer chaos. And that's my analogy for what a gas, a sample of a gas would look like if we could look at it under a really, 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 really powerful microscope. Sm they're small particles that move rapidly in straight lines until they collide. They have enough kinetic energy to overcome any attractive forces, those things like hydrogen bonding and things like that. Um, <clears throat> the molecules are very far apart. They have very small volumes compared to volumes of the containers they occupy. And the kinetic energies increase with increasing temperature, and therefore the collisions of the gas cause an increase in pressure. And we're going to look at most of this in just a second. Okay, so atmospheric pressure. When you are just standing or sitting, whatever you're doing right now, there is a pressure being exerted on your body by the atmosphere. Okay, by the atmosphere. Just being on planet Earth, there your your body is exhibiting atmospheric pressure. What's happening, even though you can't actually see it, well, unless you lived in a city maybe with a lot of pollution, um, but typically we can't see um, the gas in the atmosphere. But what's the gas made up of? The air, air gas, is made up of 78% nitrogen, 21% oxygen, and then about 1% other gases. For instance, maybe pollutant gases or water, 
as water vapor depending on how humid or how dry the area is. And so in the air that, again, we usually can't see, there's actually, sub, there's actually a substance. It's, there are gases present, and those gases are exerting a pressure, and the pressure is exerted onto your being. Now, <clears throat> over here, just to give you a different example and talk about different things, sea level, okay? The pressure that's exerted at sea level, for instance, if you were sitting in a kayak maybe on a body of water that was at sea level, the pressure is approximately one atmosphere. And most likely where you're sitting right now, unless you're in some place like Denver, Colorado, um, most likely where you are right now, you are at very close to what will be considered sea level, and the atmospheric pressure is very close to 1.0 atm. But if you were to climb up a mountain, for instance, again, go to Denver, the mile high city, the higher you go up in altitude, the lower the atmospheric pressure. And if you think about it, here's why. If you're at a higher position, let's say you're standing here on this mountain, okay, versus being down here at sea level, there's less atmosphere above you in terms of quantity than there is down here. Down here you have all this atmosphere. On the mountain you just have this much atmosphere. The more gas, the molecules that are present, the greater the pressure will be. So higher altitudes have a lower pressure, and that factors into things like cooking or baking. If you've ever looked at the back of a box of, let's say, a brownie mix, there are high-altitude instructions for baking. Just some interesting things here, altitude and atmospheric pressure. And again, as you can see, the higher that you go in altitude, like up to top of Mount Everest, the lower the pressure. Okay, so the highest on my table here, Mount Everest in altitude, 8.9 kilometers, has the lowest pressure in millimeters mercury. And then vice versa, the Dead Sea, which is in fact below sea level, has a very low altitude and has a very high pressure. Okay, what causes atmospheric pressure? I've already talked about it, gravity and the gas molecules in the air that are above you. You may have seen on that previous slide, I had pressures measured in mmHg. Well, mm is millimeters. And hg, do you remember what element that stands for? Well, that's the symbol for mercury. And so for pressure, we use, instead of a thermometer, which is measured and used for temperature, for gases and for pressures, we use a barometer to measure the pressure. And this is a barometer here. So what you would have, you've got this little dish that has liquid mercury in it and essentially an empty test tube inverted, vacuum out. That's why I say empty. They've evacuated the air and then submerged it. And what happens, liquid mercury is drawn up in there. The gas of the atmosphere, so the greater the pressure, the more this pushes down on the pool, and therefore it goes, climbs higher and higher in this empty evacuated test tube. And it would, if, if the pressure was even greater, you'd see the liquid level, hang on, let me erase this. If the pressure was greater than one ATM, if you put more pressure on this pool of liquid mercury, you would drive even more liquid mercury up into the tube, and you'd see the line would come up. And in fact, then if we measured it with a, meter stick, it would be greater than 760 millimeters mercury. So a lot of times on barometers, if you've ever seen one, they're mounted next to a ruler, and a ruler being technically a meter stick with all the hash marks. And so the millimeters mercury is truly just measuring on a meter stick how high the liquid mercury rises, and that's where the MMHG comes from. <clears throat> Okay, so let's start looking at relationships between variables. So first we're going to look at the relationship between pressure and volume for a fixed amount of gas. So assuming we're not changing the quantity, how much we have, okay? And pretend you can't initially see this. In fact, let me pretend you can't see this, okay? So initially you've got a container with a gas in it, and in fact, it's got a piston. Pistons very easily raise and lower, but we're going to uh, look at this 
just initially, like if I took a snapshot and here's what I have. I have a container with a volume of four liters at a pressure of one ATM. Now what happens if, let me just erase what I just did, what happens if I push on that piston? Well, I'm decreasing the volume of inside the container. It's going from four liters down to half the size, just two liters. And when you're applying pressure to the, to the top of the piston, they're pushing it down, what actually happens to the pressure inside? Well, you have a, the same number of gas particles in a smaller amount of space. So there's greater pressure. And as you can see, what happens? You cut the volume in half and you double the pressure. So we say that pressure and volume are inversely related, meaning they're opposites. Decrease volume, you'll increase pressure. Decrease pressure, you'll increase volume. And in fact, as you can see here, pressure times volume is always equal to a constant. Well, in fact, let me just give you the equation, how they relate if you're looking at a situation where you have a changing condition. So imagine, let's say that you did not know what this pressure was. Okay, let's say you were trying to solve for pressure. You would say this is V1 and P1, and this is V2, and we would be solving for P2 using this equation here. Okay, so that's pretty simple. You just do some algebra, divide both sides by V2, and you'd find out that P2 equals P1 times V1 over V2. And my only caveat or warning here, make sure everything's in the same unit. So volume both in liters, that's good because liters will cancel when you divide the two. And then pressure, your final pressure is going to be in the same unit of pressure that your initial or your P1 is. So when you do this math, what you would find out when you plugged and chugged here, you'd have 1 ATM times 2 liters divided by 4 liters and liters would cancel and you would end up with 2 divided by 4 which is 1 half which just so happens to match okay what we've got okay <clears throat> just for you nursing <clears throat> students in terms of inhalation and exhalation your lungs are filled with a gas they're filled with air during exhalation the diaphragm actually moves up diaphragm moves up, the volume of the, the, your lungs decreases because the diaphragm is making them smaller. It's like pushing on them like that piston. And therefore, the pressure within the lungs increases. In this case, however, air flows from the higher pressure in the lungs to the outside to relieve the pressure. So on the last video, I didn't have a, con I had basically a sealed container and gas couldn't escape. When you're breathing in your human in your in the human body, we can escape. It comes out, you know, your nose comes out your mouth as exhaled air. What happens in inhalation? Well, inhalation and exhalation are the exact opposite, so the exact opposite things apply. In terms of diaphragm now lowers, your lungs volume instead of getting smaller, the volume increases, and in fact you suck air in. You can bring more gas in. All right, so let's look at volume volume, and pressure again. So if the sample of helium gas in a balloon has a volume, we'll call this V1, of 6.4 liters at a P1, a pressure of 0.7 atmospheres, what's the new volume, we'll call that V2, when the pressure is increased to 1.4 atmospheres, call that P2. So using my equation, V1 equals P1 equals... V1 times P1, sorry, equals V2 times P2. I'm solving for V2, looking for V2. So I'm going to divide both sides by P2. So V1 times P1 divided by P2 is the equation I'm going to use to solve to figure out what the new volume is. And let's plug my numbers in. V1 is 6.4 liters. P1 is 0 0.70 atm, or atmospheres all divided by a P2 of 1.40 atmospheres. And you'll notice atmospheres cancels, and as I said, the unit for the variable you're looking for, it'll match, the unit will match whatever the unit is that's in there. So the unit of 
of V1 was liters. So my final answer will be in liters. And in fact, when you do the math here, this actually works out to be 3.2 liters. 6.4 times 0.7 and then divided by 1.4. And there's your new volume. All right, let's look at how temperature and volume are related. So if we look at the picture here again, I've got a piston. So I have a fixed amount in terms of a quantity. And the piston has this handle that easily raises and lowers. So fixed amount, okay, small flame, big flame, which just means I'm increasing T, as you can see down here. But as I increase the temperature, what happens? Again, I'm giving those molecules energy. I'm giving them heat energy. They're going to move around. It's like giving the kids even more sugar. They're going to move around, bounce around, push around even more, and they're going to want to, if given the opportunity, expand the volume, make the container bigger. And so as you can see, as temperature increases, in fact, in this particular example, it doubles. It goes from 200 to 400. The volume does the exact same thing. It also doubles. So we say that temperature and volume are directly proportional to one another. Mm. Directly proportional, which means, again, you increase one, the other one will increase. You de decrease one, the other one will decrease. And we have an equation for that. You can see it down here at the bottom. V over T equals a constant. So when we're looking to compare two scenarios... Here's the equation we're going to use. If they're both, if V over T is always equal to a constant, then I can set them equal to each other because they're equal to the same thing. Mm -hmm. And then this will work just like my pressure and my volume changing. Okay. <clears throat> I can't emphasize this enough. I said this several slides ago, but again, temperature must be in Kelvin, must be in Kelvin. All right, <clears throat> how are pressure and the amount of gas related? How are they related? So let's say, for instance, we double the amount of gas molecules we have at the same volume and the same temperature. So holding temperature, holding volume, how are pressure and N related? Well, what's that going to do to the number of collisions? To, therefore, the, number, the pressure? Well, if I increase N, um, you betcha I'm going to increase the pressure. So again, they're directly proportional to each other. And so again, we can write out an equation, N1 over P1 equals N2 over P2. Again, directly related. Or if you decrease the number of moles of gas, if you remove some gas, the pressure will decrease as well. Now, I didn't talk about this in the last slide, but since I've got a little room here, if I had this equation, and let's say I wanted to solve for P2, how would you rearrange this algebraically to solve for P2? Well, typically, most of us hate fractions, so the first thing I would do would be to cross-multiply and get rid of the fraction. So I would have N1 times P2 on one side of the equals, and N2 times P1 on the other. So first thing you always do, get rid of the fraction, cross multiply, and now hopefully this is a fairly easy algebra problem to solve. If I'm solving for P2, I'm going to get it all by itself, so I divide both sides by N1, and then my final equation, P2 will equal N2 times P1 all divided by N1, and you plug in your variables and solve. So here's our summary of relationships between things. And in fact, I'm going to write it out in terms of those equations because you're going to be working problems and need these equations. So pressure and volume, P1 times V1 equals P2 times V2. Pressure and temperature, they are directly related or proportional. So it's P1 over T1 times P2 over T2. And again, remember when you need to use this problem, cross multiply first to get rid of the fraction and then do the division. Uh, multiplication, division, whatever you need to do. Pressure and the number of moles of a gas, again, they are directly related. So P1 over N1 equals P2 over N2. And then volume and temperature, also directly related. So V1 over T1 equals V2 over T2. And always remember, T is in Kelvin. Okay, always, always, always. That would be work. That would apply here, and it would apply here. Anytime we deal with temperature in the gas laws, it has to be in Kelvin. <clears throat> all right, so when we put it all together, we don't just have to be changing one or two variables. In fact, we can look at all of it put together. 
pressure, volume, the quantity, the number of moles, and temperature, they all play a role in the gases. And so that leaves us with one final equation, and it's called the ideal gas law equation. As you can just see right there, I circled it PV equals NRT. And you probably know already, or you should know, what everything is except, except this R. And the, the R is the constant that ties them all together. So constant, this is what it always is. Now, my only warning is watch the units. Watch your units. Volume has to be in liters. Pressure has to be in atmospheres, number of moles in moles, and temperature has to be in Kelvin for this uh, gas constant to be used. Yeah, we have gas constants in other units, but this is the most common, and it's so much easier just to use this one and convert the variables where you need to into the appropriate units. Now, one other thing to talk about here, one other thing to talk about, you will not see P1s and V1s and P2s and V2s in this particular equation. This will be applied for problems where I'm looking, talking about a snapshot in time or at this given instant, here's what's going on with these variables. I'm not talking about changing anything, okay? I'm not talking about changing anything. All right, so just based on that and what I was just talking about with how everything is related, can you... See how this works. Pressure does what when volume is decreased at constant number of moles and constant temperature? Well, if V decreases, pressure is going to increase by that same amount. Cut volume in half, you're going to double the pressure. When temperature decreases, what happens to volume? Well, temperature and volume are directly related, so it will also decrease. Pressure and volume? Pressure does what when volume changes from 12 to 4? Well, you're decreasing volume by a third, so pressure is going to, what is it? Pressure and volume opposite. It's going to increase by 3. It triples. And how about volume and temperature? Again, they're directly related. So if you're increasing the temperature, it looks like by 3. Oh, excuse, yeah, you're increasing the temperature by 3. Volume is going to increase by 3. Okay, vapor pressure. The pressure vapor exerts against the atmosphere. We're not going to do a whole lot with vapor pressure. So when we're looking at vapor pressure, I, this is just a perfect, perfect um, picture of what's going on. So I've got just water being boiled. That's why it's at 100 degrees Celsius. Atmospheric pressure, the pressure being exerted by the atmosphere, assuming we're just at standard conditions, is one atmosphere, which is 760 millimeters mercury. The vapor pressure in the bubbles, these guys right here, equals the atmospheric pressure, or when that happens, I should say, it truly starts to boil. Okay, that's what that's talking about here. And so notice when you're at different temperatures, your vapor pressure is different as well. And we've just talked about the relationship between temperature and pressure, so hopefully this makes sense. <clears throat> Okay, we're going to look at here molar volume of a gas, and in fact, typically we call it standard molar volume. And what's interesting about gases is they all behave the same, whether I have helium or oxygen or nitrogen. One mole of any gas under standard conditions, standard conditions, haven't talked about standard conditions. One ATM is the pressure and 273 Kelvin is the temperature. Okay, so if you get a problem that refers to or talks about standard conditions, this is what they mean. They may not actually be giving you a physical pressure or a temperature, but if they mention standard, that's what's going on. Okay, so under standard conditions, one mole of any gas, regardless of what the gas is, occupies a volume of 22.4 liters of space. That's why we call it the standard molar volume. Under standard conditions, one mole of the gas is going to occupy a particular volume of space. And in fact, that particular volume is 22.4 liters. So that's per one mole under standard conditions. One mole of a gas, in terms of the mass, I don't know if you can see here in these 
inside the colored balloons, the mass of a mole, well, that's its molar mass. So helium, if you look up on the periodic table, has a mass of 4 grams per mole. One mole has a mass of 4 grams. So this balloon would be the same size in terms of volume, 22.4. This one would be 22.4. This one would be 22.4. But the mass of the gas inside the balloon would vary. That would be the one thing that would change because it's based on their molar mass. And remember, oxygen and nitrogen are diatomics. Helium is not, so that's why it's O2 and N2. <clears throat> and as it says down here at the bottom, notice in our discussion of gases, we never mention any particular gas. We don't just say it does this for oxygen or it does this for nitrogen. And that's because all gases behave the same, and they all follow the ideal gas law. That's what's pretty nice about them. Okay, partial pressures. We're almost done here with this section on gases, but let's look at partial pressures. So partial pressures, and in fact, I'm going to talk about this in a second, but let's just talk about for the air. Do you remember what I said, what makes up the air that we're breathing right now? It's about 78% nitrogen plus about 21% oxygen plus about 1% other gases. Partial pressure means when you have a mixture, so this only applies to mixtures, okay? When you have mixtures of gases, each gas contributes to the total, okay? So the P total, sorry, this slide has a lot on it, so let me, P total, the total pressure comes from the pressure of each gas, that's present in the sample. So again, I just erase this and put the air, erase the air information in terms of percentages, but air is made up of nitrogen, oxygen, and then several other gases. And I just put dot, dot, dot. The pressure total, the atmospheric pressure that would be measured, or that can be measured, comes from the partial pressure of nitrogen plus the partial pressure of the oxygen plus the partial pressure of all the other gases. So every time we add a gas to a mixture, it contributes more, it contributes to the total. Okay, so again, just read through the definition. The total pressure exerted by a mixture of gases is the sum of the individual partial pressure. So we just call this a partial pressure when it's one piece of the total mixture. Remember, the volume of occupied by the gas is the same. They're all in the same space, whether it's in the air that you're breathing, a balloon, whatever. Um, the volume is the same because their molecular volume is small in comparison. Gases in a mixture are always at the same temperature, at least for what we're talking about here. Obviously, they don't always have to be, um, depending on what's going on. But if you have a sample of a gas in a balloon, you know, unless you're like heating one side versus the other, or doing something real crazy, we're going to assume temperature is the same throughout. Now, what else is on this slide that kind of makes it all crazy? And that is, again, since most of you want to be in medicine, we're talking about the heart and tissues and alveoles. Okay, so the heart sends oxygenated blood out, sends deoxygenated, oxy, I can never say that word, deoxygenated blood out, and it goes to different things. Your tissues want oxygenated blood. So what happens? It sends the oxygenated blood from the heart out to the tissue cells, and then blood that needs oxygen is kicked out of those tissue cells and sent back to the heart for working. Now notice what's going on here. I've got a partial pressure of oxygen and a partial pressure of CO2. Now, what happens on the way out? Well, again, think about what happens. You inhale, you exhale. You inhale more oxygen, you exhale more CO2. So the heart is sending a more oxygenated blood out, a less carbon dioxide uh, filled blood out. But then as it comes back to the heart, notice the partial pressure of CO2 now goes above 50. And then you can see the numbers over here too and why it's de it's called deoxygenated. It's not nearly as high when it's going out in the other direction. And then just as an FYI, then compare it to the atmosphere. Okay, what's going on in the atmosphere? You can see it right there. All right. <clears throat> over here, these tables here, typical composition, um, partial pressure and percentages. I've already kind of talked about this. That's 
the air we're breathing is mainly made up of nitrogen, a little bit of oxygen, and a very, very, very little bit of other things, like those pollutant gases, water vapor, depending, again, how humid or dry the area is. And these numbers are in millimeters mercury. These numbers here also millimeters mercury. And you know, that reminds me, how do we convert the two? Well, here's the conversion. One ATM is equal to 760 millimeters of mercury, just to give you an idea there. Um, table 7.9 talks about partial pressures of oxygen and carbon dioxide in blood and tissues. You can read over that. I think it's kind of interesting. All right, so let's look at, we'll wrap this up with solving some problems using gas laws. So, for instance, here, when sensors in a car detect a collision, they cause a decomposition of sodium azide, this guy here, <clears throat> it's actually a solid, into solid sodium that, if you've ever seen anybody where their airbags have gone off and there's like a white powder everywhere, this is what it is. And then nitrogen gas, and guess what? Nitrogen gas, this guy, is what fills the airbag up. Okay, and this generates it within about three one-hundredths of a second, which makes them very good life-saving devices. So the question is, how many liters of nitrogen are filled at a pressure of 1 atm, or which is also equal to 760 millimeters mercury, at a temperature of 0 celsius, which those two together, those are my standard conditions. STP is the abbreviation for standard temperature and pressure. So how many liters, so I'm going to be looking for a volume at this pressure, at this temperature, if the airbag contains 132 grams of sodium azide. Okay, so a couple important things here to note. I'm given a quantity. I'm given a quantity. However, I'm given a quantity of a reactant that is not a gas. It is asking about the gas nitrogen that's produced. So this is going to take into account something we learned in a previous chapter. It's called stoichiometry. Remember that fun. And then our gas laws. So step one, let me erase what I've got kind of written over here and make some room for myself. Step one, we've got to calculate the number of moles sodium that's produced from this reaction. And then once I know moles of my gas, then I can use PV equals nRT. Then I can look at my gas law equation to solve for volume because I have a P, I have a T, and I will then have an N, okay? And I'm looking for V. Always have R, it's a constant. So one thing at a time. First, I need to figure out my number of moles produced, okay? How many moles are produced? And <clears throat> so I, I kind of have it written out here, but let's pretend you don't know. So if I have 132 grams of sodium azide, I need to figure out moles, I need moles sodium, uh, moles nitrogen, sorry, nitrogen. I don't care about the sodium, it's a solid. The gas is what's going to fill the airbag, and the sodium, the, uh, the nitrogen is what I'm looking for. So I need moles of nitrogen. Remember from my chapter on stoichiometry, to be able to convert between one substance and another substance, I need the numbers from the balanced equation. That's the ratio. That's what allows me to convert substances. This problem gives me information about sodium azide. It's asking for information about nitrogen. Two different things. And the only way to do that, to convert between my substances, is to use the balanced equation. However, balanced equation, these are moles. Two moles of sodium azide makes two moles of sodium and three moles of nitrogen. So I'm not ready to use the numbers from the balanced equation yet, the first thing I need to do is convert out of grams into moles for the sodium azide. And as you can see right here, I already worked it out. One mole of NaN3 has a mass of 65 grams. And this is for the NaN3. Step two, then, I can convert from moles of NaN3 into what I want, moles N2, nitrogen. So this is my molar mass, this guy here. This is going to be balanced equation. Balanced equation has a 3 in front of the nitrogen. It has a 3, oops, has a 2 in front of the sodium azide. 
multiply it across the top, so 132 times 1 times 3, get that answer, divided by 65, divided by 2, and my n, I don't think that's right. Yep, so I had a typo there, sorry guys. When you do this math, it works out to be 3.05 moles of the nitrogen gas that's going to be produced. So if I'm reacting or if I have 132 grams of the NaN3 sitting there ready for impact, when it have the impact and it converts all of that into the gas, nitrogen, well, and sodium solid, but I'm, I'm caring, I care about the nitrogen here, this is going to be my N. So this is probably wrong too. All right, so that's step one. I calculated my number of moles of nitrogen produced, which is N in my gas law problems, using stoichiometry from the previous chapter. Now, step two is to use PV equals NRT and solve for V. So how do I rearrange that equation to solve for V? Well, divide both sides by P, and that'll leave V all by itself volume. It'll equal N, what I just solved for, times R, the constant, times the temperature in Kelvin, all divided by the pressure in ATM. And remember, here was my R, which has all my units to remind me of what I need to be in. So your N is going to be 3.05. Your R is going to be 0.0821. Your temperature was given in the problem, 0 Celsius, which I have to convert to Kelvin. Don't forget, always, always, always have to use Kelvin. And then divided by a pressure, which is just 1 ATM. And let's see what I get when I plug it in my calculator. I get a volume of 68.3 liters. That was 3 times 0 0.0821 times my temperature 273. Oops, I got something a little different. Sorry, when I did it a second time, just slightly different. I get my V equal to 67.2 liters. And since I did it twice and got two different answers, let me try it one more time. I probably typed something in a little too fast in my calculator. Oh, no, that one was the right answer. Oh, well, sorry, guys. My volume equals 68.3 liters when I multiply and divide all that out, okay? Okay, and then last but not least, let's look at this one. A partially filled weather balloon has a volume of 750 liters when filled with helium at a temperature of 8 degrees and a pressure of 760 millimeters mercury. What's the new volume of the balloon when it rises to an altitude where here's my new temperature and here's my new pressure? All right, so here's the deal. Even though I didn't show you an equation for when I'm changing all three variables, I can use the ideal gas law, okay? I can use the ideal gas law, and in fact, I can create, which this is going to be a little different than what's on this slide, I can set two ideal gas law equations equal to each other. So notice what I'm doing, I'm just getting all of this for instance number one, we'll call it, all the, the left-hand side. And then I'm doing the same thing and getting it all to the right-hand side for instance number two. And so this is what it leaves me with. Now, I can pick and choose what I need from there because if it's not changing, it's not going to factor in. So for instance, my R is the same. R is a constant, it's the same. So it would cancel when I do the work. And you'll notice they don't they don't mention, let's see, you've got helium, a volume, a temperature. It doesn't even mention N. Now, I'm going to show you two different ways to solve this. We're going to do this way first, though. So if N isn't mentioned, or if any variable isn't mentioned, you assume it's not changing. So what does that leave me with? It leaves me with a pressure 1, volume 1, temperature 1, equals pressure 2, volume 2, temperature 2. And so I've got a V1, a T1, a P1, and then I have a T2, looking for V2, and a P2. So what did I tell you the first thing you want to do is you want to cross multiply to get rid of the fraction. So P1 times V1 times T2 equals P2, V2 times T1. And this at least gets rid of your fraction. I think most students find this much more manageable. Now, before I'm ready to plug and chug, a couple things. Since I'm not using R, since it canceled, I have to look at my units to make sure they're the same for volume, 
temperature, pressure. So let me list out what I've got. I got a P1 of 760 millimeters mercury. I've got a V1 of 750 liters. And I have a T1 of 8 degrees Celsius. Oh, that's going to have to go to Kelvin. So 8 plus 273, 281 Kelvin. All right, and now I've got my P2, which is 100 millimeters mercury. I've got a V2 is what I'm looking for, so I'll put a question mark there. And my T2, my T2 is negative 45 degrees Celsius. So 45, so that's going to be 228 Kelvin. Very important that you note the negative there. So in other words, it becomes 273 minus 45 to get the new temperature in Kelvin. Okay, now I'm back to my equation here. I'm solving for V2. So it's going to be P1, V1, T2 divided by P2 and T1. And now millimeters mercury, millimeters mercury, that's good, that'll cancel. Kelvin and Kelvin, that'll cancel. And my answer is going to be volume in liters. That's what I've got. When you plug and chug, you should get 760 times 750 times 228 divided by 100 divided by 281. I get a volume of 4625, and that's in liters. That's eh, a little bit different than what they got there. Okay. Now, let me show you what I had on the slide here. Let's talk this one through. So, let me erase all this. Okay, so what's going on on the slide? Here's an alternate way to solve it. Okay, and that is if you want to use ideal gas law, you still can, but we're going to use it twice. We're going to use it first based on the first conditions, based on my volume of 750 liters, my pressure of 760 millimeters mercury, and my temperature of 8 degrees Celsius, which we just said was 281 Kelvin. Okay, now we always have R. R is my constant, 0 0.0821 liters atmospheres per mole Kelvin. And so what I don't have in my PV equals NRT equation is N, how much gas. And the problem says nothing about how much gas, a quantity at all, a mass, volume, nothing. But what that means is it's not changing. And I've got a balloon. I assume it's sealed. It's not adding or subtracting gas. So the, the way this problem is worked out on the slide, step one is solve for N under the first set of conditions. Figure out under these particular conditions how much gas is in there. And then step two, I can solve for volume using another PV equals NRT equation. For con we'll call this for conditions number one and for conditions number two. So you would use N because it's going to remain the same from step one. R is a constant. T would be the second temperature, but again put in Kelvin, all divided by the new pressure. Now, here's the thing, though, you'd have to be careful if you want to use this, and you'll see this um, within here, and that is, again, you have to watch your units of R. Volume has to be in liters. Well, it is. That's fine, and it will be at the end. Pressure has to be in atmospheres. It isn't. First, I have, let's see, 760 millimeters mercury for condition number one, so I have to convert from millimeters mercury into atmospheres. 1 atm is 760. In fact, under the first set of conditions, which would be right here, I would use a P of 1 atm. And then you do the same thing for the second pressure. This is supposed to be millimeters mercury. You'd use the same thing for the second set of conditions. You have to convert it into atmospheres and then plug it in and solve. Okay? And your answers, I'm guessing there's a slight typo here, but your answer should be just about the same regardless of which way you do it. All right, and that's all I have for gas laws.